Seeing the Marshall Islands as remote and far away, surrounded by hundreds of thousands of square miles of oceans and just 29 chains of small, low-lying islands, the US architects of the nuclear program saw what they'd been looking for, a bomb site. Of course, the Marshall Islands were not remote to everybody. Thousands of people lived there, and they'd been living there for thousands of years when their ancestors from Polynesia had come across the Pacific on boats and settled there. A unique culture of chiefdoms and kingdoms had been built. The Marshallese, avid and talented navigators, traded and intermarried across this 800,000 square mile territory, an area of ocean five times larger than the state of California. Incredible accurate maps were built by the Marshallese long before German missionaries or Spanish fleets descended on their shores, showing the extent of these 29 atolls and the most direct routes from atoll to atoll. Nevertheless, to the eyes of the United States, the Marshall Islands was a remote and unpopulated place, populated only by savages. The US had also eyed Ecuador's Galapagos Islands, but ended up preferring the Marshall Islands, and in particular, Bikini Atoll, because of its protected anchorage the atoll provided. And as already mentioned, a small, movable population, and what they deemed an unimportant population. In February 1946, the US went in to survey the Bikini Atoll for testing, and they began blasting the lagoon with dynamite to make way for shipping channels. The people living there weren't told why. Then on February 10th, almost 74 years to this day, the 167 islanders living in Bikini Atoll were finally clued in to their fate. Naval Commodore Ben Wyatt, who was a military governor in the Marshall Islands, gathered the Bikini Islanders together and referring to biblical stories which they learned from 100 years of Protestant missionary teachings, he told them that they were like the children of Israel whom the Lord saved from their enemy and led into the promised land. He claimed their exile would be good for mankind and to end all wars. The Bikinians didn't sign any documents really quishing their homeland, but Wyatt later testified that Bikini's chief, King Judah, had stood up after Wyatt's speech and said the Bikini people were, quote, proud to be part of this wonderful undertaking. A month later, Wyatt attempted to stage a filmed reenactment of this gathering, and you can actually go and see it on YouTube. Yet despite repeated promptings and at least seven retakes, King Judah confined his on-camera remarks to this. We're willing to go. Everything is in God's hands. The following day, February 11th, the Bikinians were loaded onto a naval ship and moved 128 miles to Rongerik, another atoll which was completely uninhabited. It was uninhabited for a very good reason. There was very little food. Over the following months, the Bikinis, Bikinians began to starve. They were then moved to Kwajalein, where the US had and still has a large military base, before again being moved, and this time to Kili Island, a lagoonless island. Unable to harvest any of their own food there, they became reliant on military rations. Years later, in 1970, the US attempted to relocate the Bikinians on Kili back to Bikini. Once again, the Bikinians had to be evacuated. The radiation was still too high in the atoll, and it still is. The Bikinians still have not gone home. So back to the atomic testing. Having removed the Bikinians, the US began leveling the islands in the lagoon, bombing the reef with dynamite, and paving over the forests to build runways, airstrips, houses, laboratories, and storage facilities. In July 1946, they began testing, first with the ABLE test, a bomb they called Gilda after Rita Hayworth's character in the 1946 film Gilda. It was exploded 520 feet above a target fleet of ships. But because it missed, it was 2,000 feet over, uh, it didn't cause as much damage as they had anticipated. A few weeks later came the Baker test. This bomb was called Helen of Bikini, and it was de detonated 90 feet below the surface. The explosion caused contaminated water to spray across the atoll. An interesting note, animals were used in this test. Pigs and rats were caged and tied on board the ships. All the pigs and most of the rats died. And I can't attest, when I was, when I was in the Marshall Islands two years ago, uh, the rats have not died from nuclear testing. So if the world does succumb to nuclear bombs, the rats will survive. <laughs> Several days elapsed before sailors were able to reboard the target ships where the animals were located. During that time, the accumulated doses from the gamma rays produced by the fission products became lethal for the animals. 
At the time, the general public was fascinated by the experience and the fate of these test animals. The Naval Commodore and Governor, at this point, of the Marshall Islands asserted in a newspaper article that radiation death was not painful. In his quote, he said, the animal merely languishes and recovers or dies a painless death. Suffering among the animals as a whole was negligible. That was debatable. While the well-documenting suffering of two Los Alamos scientists who had died of radiation injuries at Los Alamos was still secret at this time, the widely reported deaths at Hiroshima and Nagasaki had not been painless. In 1908, also, Dr. Charles Allen Porter had stated in an academic paper, the agony of inflamed X-ray lesions is almost unequaled in any other disease. And over the next 12 years, uh, after Baker, the U.S. proceeded to unleash another 65 nuclear explosions in the Marshall Islands. Between 1946 and 1958, the U.S. detonated the equivalent of 1.5 Hiroshima-sized bombs every day for 12 years. Whole islands were vaporized. Craters were scoured into the land and the sea, craters so large that you can still see them from satellites and spaceships in outer space. Two of these bombs were of particular noteworthiness. The first, the Mike shot, was detonated in 1952 in Enowetok Atoll. This is 150 miles west of Bikini. This was the first hydrothermal bomb tested by the United States. Here, a little physics background for you. Uh, your basic atomic bomb consists of uh, a dynamite ignition source that is used to trigger the fission of atoms, atoms such as plutonium or uranium. A hydrothermal bomb, on the other, hand is a fusion bomb, and its destructive course comes, force comes from the merging of hydrogen isotopes. To create the energy to do that, it has to be triggered by an atomic bomb. So the end result of a fusion bomb or a hydrothermal bomb is a thousand times more powerful than a fission bomb. So what happened over Hiroshima and Nagasaki was fission, small potatoes compared to the release of energy caused by fusion. In 1952, the U.S. tested their first fusion bomb in Enowetok. A local Menlo Park resident named Alan Jones, who I'd hoped would be here tonight, but he was uh, not feeling well, was there to witness this. Just 25 at that time, he was working for the Scripps Institute out of La Jolla and had heard Roger de Ravel when he was an undergraduate at UC Berkeley. Roger Ravel, if you're not familiar with his name, was a great oceanographer, and he was one of the first founders of what we are living through now, climate change. He started to see the effects of this back in the 1940s and 50s. Ravel, at this time in the early 1950s, was exploring the Pacific Ocean. He was mapping underwater mountain chains and caverns, and Jones really wanted to do this. He wanted to explore the South Pacific. So once he graduated from UC Berkeley, he hopped in a car, he drove down to La Jolla, and he begged to get on one, of, on one of Ravel's boats. Being handy, he was hired, and out he went on a boat into the Pacific. But little did he know until he got out to sea what their first assignment was, and that was to go witness the first hydrothermal explosion. Jones and his boat were supposed to be there to measure the waves that came from this bomb. No one knew what would happen, they weren't entirely sure that the bomb wouldn't destroy the atmosphere or somehow create a hole in it that would kill all living things on the planet. They didn't know if it would cause a tidal wave that would be so large that it would drown all coastal areas. They were really worried. Nevertheless, they decided to try it anyway. According to Jones, the bomb they created looked less like a bomb and more like a building. It was housed in a two or three story concrete bunker on an island in Enowetok Atoll. On the morning of November 1st, on All Saints Day, the U.S. blew it up. Jones was about 70 miles away when it happened. All the boats in the area were told to be at least 100 miles away. His boat had raced out of the lagoon the night before, like all the other Navy ships, but with an academic shoestring budget for funding, the motor wasn't powerful enough to create the distance it needed in the time allotted, and he and his shipmates were caught in the danger zone that morning. He said he and everyone on board were instructed to turn away from the blast. They heard the countdown as dawn approached, and they all dutifully turned away. Even so, they couldn't help notice an enormous flash of light in the sky. As one of Jones's shipmates who'd been stationed on an island in Bikini to watch it described, it was like this. He was standing in holes he'd been instructed to dig in the sand, holes that when he stood in them placed him knee deep. Officials were concerned that the shock waves from the bomb would be so enormous it would blow men off the islands. 
So there he buried himself in, 100 miles away, and dawn of November 1st, he was knee deep in sand. And here's his quote. I am now standing in the hole, 30 seconds to go. 10, now five, four, three, two, one, mark. Dead silence, no sound, nothing. Waiting 30 seconds, then looking skyward, he saw a bright pink, illu pink illumination in the early morning sky from the center outward shooting upward, making everything to nothing again. Waiting for a radio call telling him that everything was okay and the world's largest tidal wave wasn't hurtling toward him, he waited anxiously. He knew if there was a wave, it would hit in 20 minutes. Five minutes went by, nothing. Then 10, then 15. According to his instructions, he and his shipmate, a man named Darcy, were to evacuate if they hadn't heard anything in 10 minutes. At 12 minutes, panic set in. And then at 17 minutes, he heard this over the radio. Drop what you were doing and get the hell out. He and Darcy ran as fast as they could to the beach. They jumped in a rowboat and rowed as fast as they could to a Navy ship that was anchored offshore in the harbor. They had a fighting chance on the Navy cruise ship if a tidal wave were coming. They didn't have a prayer on the island. It was at this point, he said, as they approached the Navy ship, that the sound and the fury of the H-bomb began to arrive. It was totally awesome, he said. It was deafening. It was magnificent. It was like the sound of 100 thunderstorms coming at us from all directions. It would seem the heavens would burst. We all stood in stunned awe before the largest display of man's use of the hydrogen atom. For minutes, the holocaust of sound continued, he said, and thereafter, it gradually subsided. 70 miles away, Jones reported a similar experience, hearing the sound clap 17 times as it ricocheted off the water to the bottom of the, of the atmosphere and back. An hour later, he and his boatmates saw a dark cloud approach. As it got closer, they saw rain splattering the ocean ahead, but they knew it wasn't rain. It was radioactive fallout. They raced below deck, their dosimeter needles spinning wildly. When they finally emerged from the cabin a day later, a sweltering confinement because they hadn't been able to turn on the vents or the air conditioning, yet the motor had continued to run. Everything on the boat was so contaminated it had to be thrown overboard. Ropes, life preservers, buckets, and even the collections of shells they had taken during this expedition. All of it was too contaminated to keep. Jones, whose life expectancy was clearly not affected by his exposure, said that for two years after the mic shot, his blood platelet levels were dangerously low. He had to get monthly vitamin B shots. He and his wife also had several miscarriages. Two children made it to term, but one was so developmentally challenged he died shortly after birth. The other, who lived until roughly 50, was also developmentally challenged. Jo Jones wonders if it was his exposure that caused that. And as we talked, he remarked that none of his friends from the boat had children either and all but one had died of cancer years ago. So that was the mic shot. The second one I wanted to tell you about happened in 1954, and that was Castle Bravo. This was one and a half times as lar larger than Mike, and a thousand times larger than Hiroshima. Bravo vaporized an island and left a mile-wide crater in the Bikini Lagoon. Within just a few minutes of its explosion, it had shot up 130,000 feet. That's 24 miles into the sky. In its fury, it had vaporized, as I already said, and exploded in an island it rested on, and now sprayed its cooked and charred contents every which way. The majority of it was carried by winds clipping in from the west. Declassified documents show the US government knew the radioactive cloud of the bomb would travel east, as strong winds were gusting both the night before and the morning of the explosion. So why was that a problem? The wind would carry the fallout over islands populated by Marshallese people islands that had not been evacuated or warned. When I visited the Marshall Islands in 2018, I spoke with survivors of that bomb, old people now, but children in 1954, who were on Rongelap Atoll, 150 miles to the east of Bikini, the morning of the Castle Bravo detonation. They had been not warned or told about the bomb. And that morning, Nair J. Joseph, who was now 72, but was seven in 1954, saw two suns appear in the sky. There was the usual sun that rose in the east, and the one that rose every morning. It lit up the water and the beach where she played with her friends, gathered shells and sticks, and illuminated the outlines of her father and uncles as they fished. But then, for a brief moment, the western sky was also filled with light, as a bright ball of fire appeared on the horizon. Then it disappeared. 
Hours later, a cloud approached the lagoon from the west. As the sky darkened, white flakes began to fall. The people of Rongelo thought it was snow. The children, like Nerje, stuck out their tongues. They played in the light, fluffy flakes, and they rubbed it on their skin. Like the cloud that had covered Jones's boat, it was radioactive fallout. The sand, coral, fish, clams, and trees that had been scorched by Castle Bravo and turned into dust. The dust fell into their water, it contaminated their food, and over the next 48 hours, the people of Rongelot became sick. They had nausea, their skin was burned, and their hair began to fall out in clumps. It took two days before the US came to evacuate them. Not because they couldn't. They'd sent ships out to get servicemen who'd been stationed on the surrounding islands, and a large naval vessel had been anchored just outside the atoll when the bombing took place. It disappeared right after. So for two days, the people of Rongelop got increasingly sick. When the US finally showed up, they evacuated the people and took them to Kwajalein, where a team of doctors was waiting to treat them and also to study them. Over the next several decades, the US doctors made annual visits to the people of Rongelop, taking tissue samples from them, blood samples, hair samples. By 1967, 17 of the 19 children who were on Rongelop that morning had cancer. Documents show the US Department of Energy had begun a program the day after the bomb to secretly study the Marshallese. It was called Project 4.1. They didn't tell the Marshallese why they were taking their thyroids or asking for their blood. They didn't show them their reports. Here's a quote. Data of this type has never been available, said Merrill Eisenbud, a US official with the Atomic Energy Commission in a January 1956 meeting of the agency's Biology and Medicine Committee. While it is true these people do not live the way that Westerners do, civilized people, it is nonetheless also true that they are more like us than mice. In 1957, the commission told the people of Rongelop they could go back. However, they knew the island was still radioactive. They tested it, and there was much debate among scientists about whether it would harm the people. But the fear of native indolence won the day, or so the documents show. So they sent them back and resettled them. The scientists also began a control group of study subjects, a group they called a control group. These were people from Rongelop, but who were not on the island the day of the bomb. They wanted to see what happened to those people when they returned to a radioactive island. Would they, too, suffer? They also wondered how new exposures, exposures from further testing would affect the people in Rongelop. In 1958, the US began its last atomic testing program in the Marshalls. It was called Operation Hardtack. Knowing an international moratorium on nuclear bomb testing was coming, the US began exploding the bombs every few days, one after the other. 35 bombs in less than four months. Radiation levels in the air and on land, not just in Bikini and Nenoe Talk, but on Rongelop II, spiked. Not surprisingly, documents show radiation levels in the people skyrocketed during this time. Curiously, the US had sent doctors to the island right after Hardtack to test the people. The people of Ronglop were not informed of any of this, that they were part of an experiment, that the bombing was happening, that they were at risk of being further exposed. They weren't informed then, and only learned late in the 1990s about the project. For the next two decades, the people of Ronglop lived in their atoll and what we now know was a contaminated atoll. As noted earlier, many people came down with cancer. One boy died of leukemia. Most people had their thyroids removed. Miscarriages became common. Indeed, a common complaint from, complaint from women during this period were the deliveries of what they called jelly babies. These were babies who were born without bones. If you visit the island now, there's a small graveyard that was built for these tiny deformed children. For decades after being returned, the Rongelot people asked the US to evacuate them, to return to Kwajalein, to anywhere. The US refused, claiming they were at no risk. In 1985, nearly three dec decades after the people of Rongelop were first exposed, they finally got their wish although it wasn't the US who moved them, it was Greenpeace. The environmental organization came and took the dry rangalap and brought them to Majeto and Ebai Islands in Kwajalein. I'll return to Ebai later, suffice it to say, it is now known as the ghetto of the Pacific. An historical side note here, just keep in mind that as these bombs were going off and people were being forced to flee from their homes and signed up involuntarily for human experimentation programs, the Nuremberg trials were occurring. These were trials condemning Nazis for war crimes, which included using people for experimental purposes and forcibly removing them from their homes. As the US was championing human rights everywhere, the US was bombing a Pacific Island nation. Okay, that's just a side note. <laughs> back, so back to history. As I've told you uh, about the uh, 
the campaigns on both Bikini and Rongla. Those islands and atolls were now uninhabitable. So let's took it, take a look at Enawetak, and that's where the mic shot happened. It was also ground zero for the majority of the bombs that occurred during this period of time, 44 of the 67. By the end of the 1950s, it was highly radioactive and largely destroyed by the nuclear campaign. On one island, Runnet, for instance, one of the bombs sputtered and sprayed nuclear fuel everywhere. When the military came in decades later to clean it up, they noted radiation levels hundreds of thousands of times higher than background levels, and chunks of plutonium littered in the sand. It's also where the US shipped and then dumped more than 130 tons of contaminated soil from its Nevada program. In the 1960s and 1970s, after dropping the nuclear campaign, the US also used Enoweitok as a biological testing site. According to congressional testimony from the 1990s, the US released monkeys on an island called Lojwa, right next to Runnet, where there was that bomb that sprayed. And they sprayed these monkeys with a lethal cloud of bacteria. The scientists estimated the cloud traveled hundreds of miles, an area larger than LA County. They also declared it highly effective. On a side note, there have been academic papers that have looked at a connection to this uh, bombing campaign with an outbreak of flu that happened in the atolls nearby around the same time. The symptoms were the same. It is unclear if we'll ever find out exactly what happened. Those papers are all still declassified. The U.S. has also, the US also used Enoweitok as its ballistic missile target, sending missiles from Vandenberg and California to Enoweitok were blasted into islands in the lagoon. Several had tips of beryllium, which are irradiated and splattered over the islands. Nevertheless, in the 1970s, the US exhausted its interest in Netaway talk in the Marshall Islands, and still reeling from the international outcry that was made after they had returned the Bikinians to an irradiated atoll, the US promised to clean up the contamination in Netaway talk and make it safe. According to documents, the U.S. invited leaders from Enoweitok to visit the atoll in the 1970s before they began to clean it up. The Enoweitok hadn't been back since 1946. According to the Department of Energy report of the event, the Enoweitok leaders were, quote, deeply gratified to be able to visit their ancestral homeland, but they were mortified by what they saw. The islands were completely denuded. Photos from the time show an apocalyptic scene of windswept, deforested islands with only the occasional coconut tree jutting up from the ground. Elsewhere, crumbling concrete structures, warped tarmac roads, and abandoned construction and military equipment dotted the barren landscape. The DOE, Nuclear Commission, and Atomic Energy Commission began surveying the landscape to figure out how bad it was. They also started putting together a plan to clean it. They weighed the possibility of dumping all the contaminated soil and debris in the atoll, from the atoll into the ocean. They looked at consolidating it and shipping it to the US mainland. And then they weighed the possibility of dumping it all into a pit in the atoll. Craters made by atomic bombs could be used as a pit. It soon, however, became clear that no one was going to fund the bill to send it back to the US. And the EPA refused to sign off on any plan to dump it into the ocean. So that left them with only one op option, and that was to put it all into a crater pit on an island. Military leaders talked about how best to do this. The safest way to contain it, they agreed, would be to line one of these nuclear bomb craters that was left behind on an island. And they decided they would do this on Runet, which again, if you'll remember, this was the most contaminated of the islands where the bomb had fizzled and there were still plutonium bits in the sand. And they would fill this crater with irradiated soil from around the atoll and debris and then cap it with concrete. Specialized, con specialized contractors would be brought in to do this. But when the military added up the costs, Congress said no. So they had to go back to the drawing board. They were given a budget of $20 million. With that, the military decided the best route was to dump the contaminated material into an unlined crater and use soldiers to do the cleaning. Yet even then, the architects of the waste pit, the dump that is now known as the tomb or the coffin or just run it dome, knew it wouldn't hold the waste for long. At a meeting of the designers of the tube in, 1970, in 1975, many of those present, and here's a quote from a report of that meeting, seemed to realize that radioactive material was leaking out of the crater even then and would continue to do so. At that meeting, a top Pentagon official was asked what would happen if the dome failed and who would be responsible. It would be the responsibility of the United States, said Lieutenant General Warren D. Johnson of the United States Air Force. 
Between 1977 and 1980, 4,000 servicemen were sent to Eniwetok to remove contaminated soil from the islands, consolidate radioactive debris, and dump it into the unlined crater on Runnet Island. As they cleaned with no protective gear, they stepped over chunks of plutonium on Runnet and cleaned out something called the Aemon Crypt, which was on Aemon Island, that to this day, documents still have not revealed what was in it. A source I spoke with described the ground sinking and bubbling beneath the debris they removed. The debris and soil they collected, they then dumped on Runet and then mixed with concrete to create a slurry that they poured into the pit. According to sources who were there at the time, as they poured the concrete in on this very shallow island in a pit that was below sea level, the tide would pour in and out of the crater as they poured the cement, washing debris and chunks away into the lagoon and open ocean. They also mixed the cement using seawater, a method engineers I have spoken with seem incredulous about. On a side note, the troops who were there for cleaning the station at, were stationed on Lajwa, which was an island right next to it where they had done the biological weapons testing. The water they were drinking was desalinated water. Oh, no. So it was, yes, water was going in and out of the crate, and then there were a crater, and there it was desalinated, and they were drinking it. In 1980, three years after they began to clean, they finally capped this waste site with 18 inches of concrete. It now looks like a giant UFO, or as I described in my article, a diminutive astrodome. As they were finishing the final touches, troops noted debris washing ashore, then more, and then even more. With the dome already closed, they had to build a new container adjacent to the dome. Once they finished that, even more debris washed up, so they built another, but then they left. In 1986, the US and the Marshall Islands signed a bilateral compact, giving the Marshall Islands sovereignty over their own land and $120 million, a sum from the United States to the Marshallese for the damages incurred by the testing program. The compact also allowed the Marshallese to work and live in the United States without the need for visas, and it gave them health care in the United States. In return, the Marshall Islands allowed the US to keep a military base in Kwajalein, to continue using Kwajalein as a missile testing site, and they agreed to absolve the United States from all future damages caused by the nuclear testing program. The countries worked together to form an independent tribunal that would rule on health and property claims made by the people of the Marshall Islands. Over the next 20 years, more than $2 billion in claims were made. The US has just paid 2% of those claims. I'm gonna take a pause here because I wanna talk about how I got involved in this story. In 2018, I was working at Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism. I was leading a team of investigative reporters and every year, we'd find a new story and then spend the following year researching and reporting it out. In the spring of 2018, I was looking at hiring a new crop of reporters and figuring out what our next project would be. It was at this point that I was introduced to Emlyn and Ivana Hughes. They're professors of physics and chemistry at Columbia University. They were working with a group at the journalism school called the Brown Institute that connects journalists at Columbia University with engineers at Stanford to, as the grants they give are called, to make magic. The researchers wanted to figure out how to bring their work into a storytelling narrative, and although they, they didn't fit in with the idea of the magic grant, my friend who runs the Brown Institute asked me to meet with them. I walked into their office in March 2018, and they told me they were going to the Marshall Islands that summer with a handful of students to provide an independent assessment of radiation levels on the infected islands. I'm afraid I looked at them as though they were from Mars. They were quiet for a bit, and then Ivana asked if I knew where the Marshall Islands were. I didn't. I knew they were in the Pacific, but I couldn't have pointed to them on a map. Emlyn asked if I knew the US had detonated 67 nuclear bombs on them in the 1940s and 50s, and that people had died from cancer and were still living with the lingering radiation, and that hundreds and thousands of people were still living in exile, unable to return home. I hadn't. I knew none of the history. I knew none of that history, none of the stuff I have just been talking to you about. They asked me then if I'd ever heard of Godzilla. Yes, I had. Did I know Godzilla came from the Marshall Islands? This lizard was the product of atomic testing. I suppose I did know that, but I'd never made the connection. Same with SpongeBob SquarePants. He lives in Bikini Bottom with his friends. I left the meeting feeling overwhelmed. How could I have not known something so significant? I wondered if I had been taught this in school, so I actually wrote my AP American history teacher, who happens to be a nun who lives out here in Atherton. She said it wasn't part of her curriculum. She hadn't taught it. So I went to California's Department of Education, 
and asked to see the approved curriculum for high school students. I was sent to the public library in San Jose, which has all the California approved texts on display. There was not one mention. Over the next few months, after somehow wheedling a spot on the Hughes research vessel to the Marshall Islands, I told people where I was going, my friends and family, and they too seemed to know very little, and they were as shocked as I was. So in July, I flew to the Marshall Islands with LA Times photographer Carolyn Cole to learn more. We landed in Kwajalein and were escorted across the army base, unable to move freely about the island. And we were sent to a ferry terminal. There we were picked up by a boat that carried us a quarter mile to Ebai Island. And as I mentioned earlier, it's known as the ghetto of the Pacific, and it's home to displaced Rangalapis and tens of thousands of other Marshallese people. It is the most densely populated island in the Pacific and the sixth in the world, 40,000 people per square kilometer. The poverty is pronounced. In any case, we hopped on a charter boat from Ebai, and for two days, we cruised north until we hit Rangalap Atoll, where we spent the next few days, then Bikini, where we spent two weeks, and finally, Anawetak. As a visitor, these atolls are extraordinary. We saw no other people or boats the entire time we were there. There was no light pollution. I never even saw a plane fly overhead. For three weeks we were at sea, there was nobody else. I saw the Milky Way in unbelievable clarity. It was funny, I was on the boat one night on the bow, and there was a huge cloud over the sky. And I was upset because I couldn't see all of the stars. And the next night, I lay down on the bow and looked up again, and the cloud was there. And I complained to the skipper that there always seemed to be clouds in that part of the sky. And he looked at me and he said, that is the Milky Way. <laughs> Sharks, dolphins, and sea turtles were everywhere, even the occasional whale. It was a steamingly ecological paradise, until you started to look closer. Concrete rubble, iron rebar, abandoned anchors, iron, chains, and other debris littered the lagoon floors. Abandoned concrete bunkers and broken concrete were all over the islands. And of course, at the bottom of Bikini is an armada of sunken ships, ghostly in the dark and quiet. I remember, I was on this trip to observe Emlyn and his team. He and young, un, a young undergraduate held Geiger counters every day and marched across the islands, recording the background radiation. In some places, the Geiger counters screamed. The results of that research was published in July. What they found was that while much of the northern atolls have recovered, the big islands of Anatewetak and Rangalap, for instance, only have very low levels of background radiation. Other islands, like Runnet, where the tomb stands, and Nine, which is the northernmost island in the Rangalap Atoll, have emissions as high as those, not emissions, but background levels, as high as those found near Chernobyl and Fukushima. They're not as hot as the cores of those sites, but higher than those found in areas near those meltdowns, areas that are now fenced off and guarded by men with guns, too dangerous for people to visit. In the Marshall Islands, there are no signs people telling people to stay away. There are no fences, and there are certainly no men with guns. In fact, what we found instead was evidence of camps and barbecues. We saw burned wood, charred coconut crab exoskeletons, coconuts that had been chopped open and consumed. People are going to these islands, sleeping and gathering food from them. And then, of course, there's the dome. Well, I think there is a sign now when we visited. There was no sign warning us to stay away. No warning that underneath this concrete cap was plutonium, toxic waste, and irradiated material. And no warning that it was leaking into the lagoon where people fish and harvest for clams and other invertebrates. Indeed, we only learned it was leaking in the spring of 2019 when Carolyn Cole, the photographer I was working with, went back to the Marshall Islands to get more photos. Spending her week in Maduro, she saw flyers for a presentation that Terry Hamilton, the US Department of Energy contractor in charge of nuclear issues in the Marshall Islands, had just given a public talk about the dome at the Marshall Islands Resort, which is just one of two hotels on Maduro the Capital Island. I called around. Hamilton and his organization, Lawrence Livermore Laboratories, wouldn't tell me what he had said. So I had to call my sources in the Marshall Islands and an anthropologist that I speak with often, Holly Barker, who's up at the University of Washington. I knew they would know. Holly sent me photos of his PowerPoint presentation. What he had told the audience was that the dome was leaking, that sea level rise was making the situation worse, and that every day as the tides rose, so too did the dome. And as the tides receded, the dome sunk back down. And the waters that were going in and out of the dome were carrying radioactive material. 
He also told the audience that day that rising sea levels and bigger waves, the consequences of climate change, were threatening the integrity of the dome. The dome, he said, was at risk of catastrophic collapse. The DOE's response to this news was horrific and shocking. First, they said, yes, the dome is at risk of collapsing, but that's not the responsibility of the United States. The dome is on Marshallese land and therefore belongs to the Marshallese. The second thing, the one I still scratch my head about, was this. They said, even if it does collapse, nobody needs to worry. Why? Because the lagoon, the Anahuaytoc Lagoon, where the dome sits, is already so contaminated and irradiated that if the contents of the dome were to spill in, there'd be no noticeable change in the level of contamination or radiation. It was a stunning revelation. So did that mean that the US hadn't really cleaned up the atoll as they had promised? Did that mean that the food that the 300 NOA talk people who live there now, the ones who harvest the clams, sea cucumbers and fish from the reefs, does that mean their food is irradiated, not safe for consumption? Not just this, but getting to the broader issue of climate change, as the sea levels rise and the dome is at risk, is the entirety of the Marshall Islands at risk. The Marshall Islands are a conglomeration of 29 coral atolls, the remnants of a chain of ancient volcanoes that once jutted from the ocean floor. The islands now average about six feet above sea level. And as seas rise, more and more of that land is disappearing. To give you an idea of what that's like, or what the Marshall Islands are like if you haven't been there, if you fly to Majuro and look out the window of the airplane, you'll see nothing but ocean for hours after hour. And then the pilot will begin to announce that the plane is approaching. And as the plane descends and you look out the window, you'll see the ocean bluescape interrupted by a necklace of white sand, a circle of skinny islands. And then when you land and you grab a taxi to your hotel, you'll drive down the only major road in Majuro, a road that runs the length of three islands, which is connected by bridges. From where your window, you'll see both the ocean on one side and the lagoon on the other, and just small patches of grass or sand on either side. The Marshall Islands is slowly, slowly being enveloped by water. When the king tides approach, much of the capital city, Majuro, goes underwater. People are waking up with water on the floors of their house. A trip in a cab to the hospital requires driving through a foot deep, almost lake of water as it rains and the tides come in. Over the past several months, diseases such as dengue fever have hit the island in numbers that are unprecedented, but enabled by a warming climate and standing water. Just as the Marshalls were ground zero in the Cold War for the most destructive forces on the planet, they're once again ground zero for climate change. When we were there in the summer of 2018, we dived and snorkeled through the Bikini Lagoon. We were with a Stanford graduate student who had visited two years before. She was there to study mutation rates in coral. The coral she had tested two years before was all dead. Vast reef beds were dead or dying from the heat. The water temperature was over 90 degrees at the surface and 88 degrees dozens of feet down. And one day, the Bikini Lagoon was choked in a green and brown cloud of algae. We couldn't see anything. The following day, we went to Bikini Island and dead fish lined the beach as far as the eye could see. They'd been cooked and choked by the hot water and resulting algae blooms. But here's the thing. We could all leave this talk feeling sorry for the Marshall Islanders, deciding they are victims, and wring our hands about it and move on. But that's not helpful. And as an anthropologist friend of mine says, that's just another form of colonial oppression. Instead, we can engage with the resourceful people who have withstood centuries of outside forces claiming their lands and culture. I met with a community of Marshallese in December in Spokane. They're here in the United States because they want to provide their children with a US education the best education in the world, and the opportunities we as Americans enjoy and are providing the Marshallese. The Marshallese I met aren't stewing over the past. They aren't rolling over and giving up. They're here working in the United States to give their children the tools they need to help, to help as doctors, scientists, engineers, and leaders. The Marshall Islands is now on the UN Human Rights Committee, the first time a nation of indigenous peoples has claimed such a role. Their former president, Hilda Heine, grabbed the international community's megaphone in Paris and in New York, alerting the world to the plight of sea level rise, and she was instrumental in spurring the Paris Accord. Most Marshallese don't want to leave the islands. It's their home, but they're searching for the means to stay, whether that is helping to slow the accumulation of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the shoring up of the islands that they can live on, providing their children with the tools they need. The Marshallese have never given up before, and they're refusing to do so now.